This is the final portion of chapter three, where we cover the last biological molecule, which are the nucleic acids. Think for a second. Can you name some examples of nucleic acids? Three important ones include DNA, RNA, and ATP. What do these nucleic acids do? Well, they have two essential functions. One is information storage. DNA and RNA are helpful in storing genetic information. The other function is to store and transfer energy in the form of ATP. We're mainly going to talk about DNA and RNA in this chapter, but we will talk a lot about ATP when we talk about cellular respiration. Now, we have to think back. This is going to be a big, long macromolecule. It's going to be a polymer, which is made of monomers. So we need to know the name of the monomers that form nucleic acids. The monomers are called nucleotides. And you need to be able to recognize and, and know the parts of the nucleotide. Nucleotides are made up of a phosphate group. That's one of our functional groups. So now, hopefully, you're starting to recognize it. Remember that it has a negative charge and it makes something polar. It also has a sugar, a monosaccharide included here. It's a five carbon monosaccharide. If it's DNA, it's deoxyribose. If it's RNA, it's ribose. And then the last part is called a nitrogen containing base. It's green in this picture. You can see that it has a lot of nitrogens so that's why they call it a nitrogen containing base. In a nucleotide, there are four possible different nitrogen containing bases. The bases in the DNA molecules are thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. You can see their shapes in the table below. The bases in RNA are uracil, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. The only thing that differs between the bases in DNA and RNA is that there is no thymine in RNA and there is no uracil in DNA. The others are the same. But every nucleotide of DNA and RNA differ in their sugar. The five carbon sugar in DNA is deoxyribose. In RNA, it's ribose. Look at the picture below and see if you can find the difference. On the second carbon, the one that's labeled two prime, in DNA, there's an H coming off of that second carbon. When you look at RNA, there's a hydroxyl group. So the deoxy means you took away the oxygen on the, that ribose sugar. So it's a deoxy ribose. Now, when we start to build the polymer of DNA or RNA, we join together the phosphate groups of one nucleotide to the sugar of the neighboring nucleotide. So in this image to the right, the phosphate group is yellow, the sugar is represented in a blue rectangle, and then the base is green or orange. So the sugar of one nucleotide is connected to the phosphate of its neighbor through what process? dehydration synthesis. The base part is not part of that that's, uh, polymer making. The base sticks out to the side. The bond that forms between the neighboring nucleotides is a covalent bond and it has a special name. It's called a phosphodiester bond. So if we look at it with a uh, a little bit more representation, representative sorry, of the shape, you can see that the, there's one nucleotide blown up there, and you can see that it goes sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate along the backbone, and then the base sticks out to the side. Now when we look at DNA, DNA forms these long polymers, However, DNA is a double helix, not a single strand. So two of those long polymers come together to form the final molecule. The two strands twist around each other 
and are held together through interactions between the bases, the things that are sticking out to the middle, and the bases can actually hydrogen bond with each other to hold the two strands together. The bases pair in a very predictable fashion. It's called complementary base pairing. T's, thymines, always pair with A's or adenines. And C's, cytosines, always pair with guanines or G's. Which means if you know the sequence of bases on one strand, you can predict the sequence of the other strand. So if you look at the sequence below, one strand is T-A-A-G-C-C-T. Well, that first T is going to pair with an A on the opposite strand. The A is going to pair with a T on the opposite strand. The next A with another T, and then a G will pair with a C, and a C will pair with a G. This is always the case. This is called complementary base pairing. The other thing that's going to become important, and for right now I'm just going to introduce it to you, but later it will be important, is the fact that these two strands of DNA that twist around each other to form this double helix and are held together through hydrogen bonds through complementary base pairing do not run in the same direction. One runs in one direction and the other runs in the opposite direction. We say these run in an anti-parallel direction. This shows you how the bases hydrogen bond with each other. Now you know what a hydrogen bond is. It forms between two polar molecules and you have an understanding of polarity. That means that there must be some sort of polar covalent bond because there is an electronegative atom. So if you look at the top image, you see that the oxygen on the guanine at the top can hydrogen bond with the hydrogen from the, um, that's connected to the nitrogen on the cytosine. All right, and on the bottom, you have the opposite connection. However, if you look at the adenine and thymine connection, notice on the adenine, at that bottom spot is not an NH2, but instead a CH. So because it's CH, there's no polarity there. There's no polar covalent bond. And therefore, the oxygen on the thymine, that carbonyl group right there, cannot hydrogen bond with the, the H from the carbon hydrogen on the adenine. So this is just a little animation showing you how this works. Each new nucleotide is brought in through an enzyme, hydrogen bonds form, and then the dehydration synthesis reaction happens, connecting the sugar and the phosphate to the next sugar phosphate. The bond that's formed is a new covalent bond called a phosphodiester bond. Pay attention to the complementary base pairing that's going on. The next Nucleotide is a G, so we're going to bring in a C. The next one is a T, we're going to bring in an A. A's and T's only have two hydrogen bonds holding them together. C's and G's have three. Because one strand predicts the sequence of the other strand, complementary base pairing is the mechanism that is used by the cell to copy DNA when that is needed. Every time a cell has to divide, it has to give the new cell an identical copy of the original DNA. So what happens is the cell takes the DNA double helix, separates the two strands, uses each as a template to build new strands, which are shown in orange in this picture. Then each new cell will get one copy each of the new DNA. So one cell will get an orange and blue hybrid and another cell will get the other orange and blue hybrid. 
those two pieces of DNA are identical to each other. Also, we have to think about the importance of DNA in terms of the central dogma, right? We know that the DNA is going to direct the cell into making proteins, and we just learned that proteins do everything, right? So we need to talk a little bit about this process. So first, let's think about when we when we copy the DNA, like we did in the last slide, we have to copy the entire piece, right? Every frame from end to end, every piece of DNA needs to be copied. However, when we do the central dogma, we don't copy everything. Does anyone know what part of the DNA we do copy to take those instructions into the cell to make a protein? It's called a gene. So a gene is a shorter segment within the DNA that has a specific sequence that is copied into a shorter RNA, and then that RNA takes it out to become a protein. So a gene is a short section of DNA that holds the instructions to make proteins. So how does the genetic information go from DNA to RNA? What do you think? It's complementary base pairing, right? So the uh, Gs of the DNA are gonna pair up with Cs from the RNA, and the Cs from the DNA are gonna pair up with Gs from the RNA. The T will pair with A, and the only one that's different is the A in the RNA won't be able to, I'm sorry, the A in the DNA won't be able to find any thymines that have ribose sugar. Instead, it will hydrogen bond with the uracils. So where does the DNA to RNA part of the central dogma happen in a eukaryotic cell? It happens inside the nucleus. The RNA then has to leave the nucleus and go find a ribosome so that it can form the protein. All right, a little bit about RNA. RNA is not a double helix. RNA is single-stranded, so it doesn't have the second strand. It's shorter. The RNA is only the length of the gene. Remember that RNA has U and not T, and it's made in the nucleus, but it can leave. For all intents and purposes, DNA is in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell and doesn't leave the nucleus ever. It's our, it's our precious copy. We don't want to ever have um, risk being damaged in some way. The last question on that last slide asked, how did the RNA code for the protein? That happens through an, a unique process at the ribosome that involves the ribosome and some other RNAs, called tRNAs and rRNAs, that help translate the message from the language of nucleotides into the language of amino acids. So instead of going one nucleotide at a time to make the protein, we read three nucleotides to indicate one amino acid. Three nucleotides equals one amino acid. We call those three nucleotides a codon. They code for one amino acid. So here you can see that the DNA has two strands, GAG, CTC. We're going to copy one of the strands, the bottom strand in this case, into RNA. So we're going to make GAG. That's an RNA. And then RNA is going to go to the ribosome. It's going to be read in sets of three or codons. GAG is going to code for one amino acid. We talked about, when we talked about the proteins, how in sickle cell, one amino acid is changed that causes the protein to fold incorrectly, which causes the quaternary structure to be incorrect, which then influences the shape of the red blood cell, which then can have drastic effects on the body in terms of getting oxygen to the cells. That one change in the amino acid is a result of one change in the DNA. Changes at the DNA level are called mutations. They are alterations or changes in the base sequence of the DNA. Some mutations, like this one, can be harmful. They can cause disease. Other mutations can be helpful and they can drive evolution.
So sometimes the word mutation gets a little bit of a, a negative connotation, but think more like along the lines of the movie uh, X-Men or something, right? They had mutations that gave them superpowers. So sometimes mutations are good and sometimes they're not. It's important to remember that mutations occur randomly. Uh, they're not necessarily directed. So they occur through um, chemicals that can damage the DNA, things like smoke or carcinogens or um, UV rays that can cause these changes in the DNA. If the change ends up being part of your, your germ cells, then that's when you can pass the mutation to the next generation. So if it's in your egg or your sperm, then if you have children, your children will inherit those mutations. DNA sequences and protein sequences can serve as kind of tape measures to help us measure timing of evolution. So if you take DNA sequences in, in this image here from maybe four different organisms, A, B, C, and D, and you sequence the nucleotides of their DNA, or you could sequence the amino acids in their proteins, and then compare them to each other and look for similarity, right? If there is more similarity between two of the organisms, they will be closer related in an evolutionary sense than ones that have more differences in their DNA. We saw this version of an evolutionary tree when we were looking at the domains. So remember the bottom of the Y is a common ancestor and then each branch point is when things changed a little bit. So likely a change in the DNA that caused a change in a protein that caused a change in a function or a trait and so over time, those organisms changed in that way. So in this case, organism A is much more distantly related to the rest. Organisms C and D are much more closely related and have much, a much more recent common ancestor, which would be at the branch point between C and D. All right, so I have a couple of just fun questions to um, go over. Think about these as you're studying for the test. What's the monomer of a carbohydrate called? Give an example of a polymer of a carbohydrate. What characteristics does a hydroxyl group bring to a sugar molecule? Sugars have lots of hydroxyl groups. What's the monomer of a protein called? Can you give an example of a kind of protein? What's the monomer of a nucleic acid? Can you give an example of a nucleic acid? What cellular structures depend on lipids? Which of the four biological molecules provide us with the most energy? Carbs, proteins, lipids, or nucleic acids? Which of the following here is listed is a disaccharide? These ones, I'm giving you the answer. Sucrose, that's right. Plants store glucose as starch, that's right. Animals store it as glycogen. Now this is just kind of an example of how I will probably ask you to apply your knowledge. This is why it's important that you know vocabulary because the question will have lots of vocabulary in it and the answer choice as well, but the question is not really what does this vocabulary mean? Okay, so this question states, this lysozyme protein molecule, so we know we're talking about a protein, is found in tears and protects the eye from bacterial infections. So if it's found in tears, that means it has to be dissolved in water right, because tears are, are watery. So which of the following would best describe the outside of this protein molecule? So basically when a protein folds up into its three-dimensional shape, some R groups are gonna face inward, other R groups are gonna face outward. Keep in mind, some R groups are hydrophobic and some R groups are hydrophilic. 
So if you have to be dissolved in water, what kind of R groups would you want facing out? So let's read the choices. The R groups on the surface of the molecule on the outside are mostly hydrophobic. The R groups on the surface of the molecule are mostly hydrophilic. The R groups on the surface of the molecule are mostly nonpolar. Or the R groups on the surface of the molecule are constantly changing between nonpolar and polar as the protein chain bends and folds. So hopefully you know your vocabulary. And if you know your vocabulary, when you read A and you read C, you would think to yourself, nonpolar and hydrophobic are the same. So those can't be right because they're basically saying the same thing, that they don't like water. And we know this protein is dissolved in water. B suggests that they're hydrophilic, and that's very likely. A hydrophilic R group is very much going to be like dissolved, being like dissolving in water. And D just doesn't make any sense. We did say at times that proteins made purposeful shape changes, but we didn't really talk about them constantly bending and changing shape. So that's not a, a likely answer. So the answer here is B. If you don't understand this, email me, read about it, think about it, because you do need to understand this. All right, here's another kind of application prep, uh, question. When proteins are heated, they usually denature. If moderate heat is applied to a molecule of DNA, what part of the molecule would break down first or break apart first? So first we have to think about proteins. When proteins denature, what bonds break? So let's go back and think about the kinds of bonds we find in proteins. What kind of bond connects amino acids together to form primary structure? They're covalent bonds and they're called peptide bonds. Then we have secondary structure. What kind of bonds hold secondary structure in place? Hydrogen bonds between non-neighboring amino acids. And then we have tertiary structure, which includes hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions, and sometimes covalent bonds, and sometimes um, ionic interactions, right? So if we were to heat a molecule, what kinds of bonds would be the first to break? Which ones are the weakest? Right, the hydrogen bonds that are holding the secondary structure together. So given that, think about what would break apart first in the DNA, DNA molecule. Would it be the nucleotides along each side? So would the nucleotide break apart? Would the sugar phosphate backbone separate from the base? Or would the nitrogen base pairs separate in the interior of the molecule? So again, you have to know where your bonds are and you have to know what kind of bonds are used where. The answer here is the nitrogen base pairs would separate in the interior. Let's go back. Oh, I guess I can't go back. The bonds that connect nucleotides together are covalent bonds called phosphodiester bonds. The bond that connects the nucleotide, I mean the nitrogenous base to the sugar phosphate is also a covalent bond. All right, so it's a good idea to kind of organize your thinking, maybe something like this, make a table so that you kind of know the monomers, the polymers, some examples of them, some the types of bonds found, things like that. Just some nice little drawings that, that you might consider, maybe draw the, the hydrogen bonds between.